I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It's already been a good 11th hour. The music was, was prophetic. It was just, we played it as it came to us, and, and the Lord wrote the words as you heard it written right there. And so let's pray before we get into this today. Lord, I ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we can learn your word together as a family. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to welcome everybody in from around the world. And uh, it's just so awesome to see people chat in from around the world. I mean, when you hear nations tuning in and nations saying, we're here today, and, and they put the little fire emojis and, the, and all these little things up they'll put up, it's just awesome to see. I love our partners. I pray for our partners every single day. There's not a day goes by that you don't have prayer. And I mean real prayer, not just God bless our partners. This is real prayer. I, I pray over every aspect of your life uh, and try to cover it all. And it doesn't make any difference how long the day is, how long it went. Before I sleep, I pray over our partners. And um, I just want to thank you for praying over, over me and the team and everybody here at Church International also. Hallelujah. Now, I want us to, uh, I want us to look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. And we're just going to cover a few things today, uh, just some things the Lord said to, to cover. That um, says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I think one translation says it this way, in dying you'll die. So he was going to lodge death into his spirit that day if he ate of that tree and disobeyed God and got into rebellion with God. See, there's nobody in hell that's not in rebellion against God. People don't accidentally go to hell. There, there is a hell. And this, all this stuff where people say, oh, you know, there's not really a hell and this and that. Well, you know, they'll have a rude awakening one day. You don't want to be like the rich man and in hell he lift up his eyes. Didn't say he lifted up his eyes. He said he lift them. He lift up his eyes. That means he just changed scenes. He was just looking at this, and then he never realized he left his body and his his vision and gaze just changed, and he was in hell. So I want you to see this. He said, the day thou, he said, don't eat of this, for in the day that you eat thereof, or in other words, the day you disobey me, the day you get out of my word, and the day you do something else, you will surely die. In dying, you're going to die. You will lodge spiritual death and physical death into your existence at that point. Now, I want you to understand something that this, the Lord said this to me, this is the generation that will influence kings. This is the generation that you're looking at, the prophetic generation. This is the Lord's generation, as the song says. This is the generation that will change kings, that will influence kings, it will change kings. This is it, and God's reaching for a prophetic generation. You know, when Elijah stretched himself on that boy, and the boy had died. And the woman came to Elijah and said, did you come to remind me of my sin? She thought the boy had died because of her past sin. She said, did you come to remind me of my sin, that you would kill my son? And Elijah said, watch this now. Now this is a generation that has died, completely died. And the mother knew it, and the mother was weeping and crying over it and saying, because, now watch this close. This is prophetic teaching. Because of my past, because of what we didn't do, what we failed at in our past, it cost me this whole generation. It cost this generation its life. And right now, when you look around and you see what's going on in the world and you see what's going on in, in this generation and you watch the people and the young of this generation and you see them and you may be saying, they look like they're, they have no values at all. 
And it's like this. Are we going to have to live with the fact that we failed a whole generation, that we failed them, and they died? What do we do? Then suddenly the prophets come on the scene. That's another reason prophets are spotlighted. When prophets are spotlighted, we're not only in danger of the Antichrist pushing into the earth, but also of losing a whole generation of people, a whole generation of the young. And Elijah said this. When you go back and read the story, he told the woman, he said, give the boy to me. Bring him to me. And he took the boy and took him up into his chamber. In other words, he said, give me, give the prophet the generation. This is a prophetic generation. And Elijah walked and prayed, and he stretched himself on the boy, and he laid himself down upon a dead generation and, and began to breathe into him. Then he'd get up and pray and walk, and then he'd do it again, and he did it again. And it took more than once. But the boy sneezed seven times and woke up. And now he's, it's a prophetic generation. It's a generation that came back to life under the breath of the prophet. And so this generation is going to be saved and it's going to make it because it's a prophetic generation. It's the Lord's generation. And so the prophet's everywhere right now ought to be saying, if you don't have the next generation on your mind, then, then you're in the wrong position because prophets always come to rescue another generation, to save something that's coming. And no matter what you see out of the college crowds and out of the high school crowds and whatever you see out of young people being convinced they're furries and they're animals and they're this and they're, they're this and they're this raised by an AI generation, no matter what you see, Listen to the voice of the prophet. Listen to the voice of the prophetic voice of God. Bring them to me. <laughs> Bring them to me. And the breath of the prophet, the prophetic breath raised a generation back to life. And he presented it to his mother again, alive. And the mother said, I know you're a man of God. In other words, I know the prophets are real. I know the prophetic is real. So I'm saying today on this program, bring your children to the prophetic. Bring them to hear the prophetic voice. Bring them to, to walk in the wind of God. Bring them to the prophet and let him speak to them. And it will raise a generation back to life. Hallelujah. So this is the generation that will influence kings. It's the generation that will change kings because it's a prophetic generation. It's a generation of prophets being raised from the dead. Nothing Satan fears more than a, an army of prophets because they speak from tomorrow. They speak with the breath of the future. They are nourished by the future. They live by the future. They breathe in the future. And he's afraid of them. He's afraid of them because he's a, a being of the past. He's a being of the shadows. He lives outside the light. He's a beast of the field. Hallelujah. Now, notice he told Adam this, and I, and I want to continue this thought. I, I wanted to stop. The Lord impressed me to stop and interject that to you. That the Lord told Adam in Genesis 2, 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He didn't say it might be. He said, you're going to. In the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. In dying, you're going to die. You'll die spiritually the moment you disobey me. And then it's going to take its toll. And you will have let death into this existence and it will kill you. And it will separate you from me, which is real spiritual death, separation from God. Now, I've wondered before, and I have wondered this, about how could, for instance, someone steal. I was thinking about the stolen election and so forth. How people can steal an election. Now, listen to what I'm going to say. 
then go to great lengths to do so. I mean elaborate means to get it done. And then knowing they stole it, how do they go in office and operate as if they want it? Because it's got to be in their mind, I'm not supposed to be here. This is a lie. How do men do that? How do they live in such a lie? You know, I've wondered that before because they know inside them that every decision they make is a lie. Every law they pass is a lie. Everything they're doing is a lie. Yet they smile and are willing to go on and on for as long as they can, electing one lie after another. I wondered before how they do this. Well, and it's not just a political message right here. But I'm wondering how such a, how such a thing could be perpetrated and lived in with no conscience at all. Well, they have a lot of help. The Lord God told Adam in Genesis, the day you eat of it, said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. In dying, you'll die. When Adam violated this command, sin entered the earth. Now, I want you to think about that. It wasn't in the earth at that moment. It wasn't in Adam's door. It wasn't in his realm. He was protected from it all. Now, Satan was lodged around out there and was going to have to be driven out. But Satan, iniquity was first found in him, but it was over a man. But this is man's domain. So sin hadn't entered the earth. Rot and decay wasn't here. Man became half dead knowing good and evil. Only rot and decay would come in if the man gave in to sin because the man is the door into the earth. You know that Jesus talked about being the door. He came through the door. In other words, he was born of a woman, so he had full authority as a man, and he was God in the flesh. Man now had dead thoughts at this time. When Adam sinned, he became half dead. What does that mean? He knew good and evil. Man now had dead thoughts that were producing dead words that led actions, led to actions that led men to death. Before sin, Adam lived by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Therefore, every thought was thoughts of life that produced words of life that produced actions that led to life. This is why there was a tree of life in the midst of the garden. Everything led to life. When Adam sinned, someone else began talking to him and controlling him. Man now had a sin nature. Now, sin nature was something he didn't have before. He was born of God. He, he was, he's called God's son in Luke chapter 3. He was his covenant son. In other words, he cast his own image. God did in the earth. He made him to look just like him. He, he laid down upon him and breathed his spirit into him. And his blood, God's blood, which is light, mingled with the, the, the flesh and the, and the blood and the bone. It came through the marrow, produced the blood, and light traces all in the blood. And even the lamins in the body are shaped like a cross. So redemption was built into the blood from the day one. It was prophesied, man's blood prophesied. That's why uh, Abel's blood could call to God from the ground. It had a prophecy in it. Man's blood had a prophecy in it. it inside his being, you know, the lamins, I think they call them, are shaped like a cross. And it looks like a cross, and there's light in the blood. So the prophecy of the cross was built into the man's body in his blood from the day God breathed. Now you know how Abel's blood called to the Lord God from the ground or called to the Lord from the ground. It's calling for redemption. So in this, something else now started talking to Adam because Adam had a sin nature controlling him. Something that would respond to the voice of Satan. Now you think about this a minute. Until then, Adam only listened to the voice of God. But now 
He would walk with God in the cool of the day, in the ruach, in the animation of God, the movements of God, the, the impulse of God, in God's heart beating. God, he was covenant son. That's what the Ark of the Covenant represented. The one in heaven was Adam's seed at that time. And that's why the last Adam took it back and is seated there today. So now you know, you have an idea of why the blood could call. It was a prophetic, redemptive prophecy in the man's blood. Now, someone else began talking to him now because a sin nature came in. And when it came in, it darkened his mind. It darkened his, and his blood carried that death throughout his whole body. Because blood is like liquid soul. Whatever a man thinks, so is he. Out of his heart, it flows. And it'll go through his whole body, carrying those death thoughts. So now, he had a sin nature. Satan could speak, and man would respond. Before he was beneath him in the lower call. But now he's leading him. He traded places with a man. Now, man became Satan's slave at this point. Satan had gained access. Now watch this close. To the man's imagination. That's what he wanted. And he was using it. Now, man had now... Uh, under Satan's leadership, their imaginations. Their imaginations would now dream up ways to steal, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Mankind never dreamed there were so many ways to die. He never dreamed of making death an art. You can see it as it developed over time. Man's imagination got more and more creative with death to torture men into coercing them into saying things, horrible torture. Till they would, they would. I remember reading about, you know, there was a movie, uh, what was it, Inglorious Bastards, I think it was called. And it was about um, Jewish men that, that hunted Nazis and things like that for the atrocities the Nazis committed. Something to that effect. I never saw the movie, just clips of it. But I did see the real men that it was based on. And they were the most precious. It was three of them. And they were the most precious men. And one was a Jewish man who, uh, I think, well, two might have been Jewish. But anyway, one of them was taken prisoner and he said how, how that little Nazi in front of him, he said he was just a little rat. He said, I could have killed him with my bare hands, but they had him tied behind his back and had him tied to a chair, torturing him. Death had become an art out of a man's imagination. And just to make it worse, they took a pistol barrel from one of their pistols, stuck it in the man's mouth and made him bite down on it and then took their fist and hit him under the chin until they break his teeth out. An art to torture. And there's tortures that's just so horrendous. Men learn how to disembowel men. They learn how to do things. All of this came in when Satan got control of man's imagination. That's why you see ruthless things that can happen, and ruthless dictators can do things. Look at the death camps of, of, of Hitler's Nazis, how they had the Jewish people and killed over six million of them. How they could be so heartless and beat babies up against train cars. And whatever they did, I mean, could just ruthlessly murder and slaughter them. Look at Hamas when it came over the Israeli border on October the 7th. Look at the atrocities. Some of the pictures they, you can't even see. They, they can't show it. They, they won't let it be shown some networks. It's so horrendous beheading little babies, holding them down doing it, do, doing horrible things to the women to the point. I caught a glimpse of one of the pictures. It was so horrible you can't stand to look at it. Where did they get that from? It's when Satan gained control of man's imagination. Then sin and the atrocities of sin knows no bottom, no depth. It just goes on forever and ever. 
That's why it's called a bottomless pit. It never ends. And there's never seen where it would go. If a man was allowed to live, say like Hitler or Stalin or somebody Lenin or somebody like that or Paul Potts and just evil dictators, if they could go on and on forever, evil would have just kept going and going and there would be evil today you couldn't even fathom of how they could make stealing and killing and destroying an art out of the human imagination. It's huge, the imagination of a man. And Satan wanted control of that imagination. And so he gained control of it when man rebelled against God. The acts of sin were moved into the realm of the imagination. They were imagining ways to sin. You have no idea we don't how big that is. And I used to hear stories how they'd stand a Jewish person up, the Nazis, and just cut an arm off and just time them to see how long it would take to bleed to death. Lampshades made out of Jewish flesh. And then, then their, their infatuation with experimenting on twins because they knew they were God's people. And they were in search of this secret something and the atrocities of Satan's hatred and rage using the imagination of an evil person. What would make a man? This is something else entirely. I remember uh, listening to crime stories about a man who was a serial killer who cut a woman's head off and put it on top of his head and drove through six states with it on top of his head before anybody noticed it. What you think, what kind of sicko people say, that's a sick, sick person. That is a demon-possessed person. It is a person that Satan is using the imagination of that human that is the imagination he got from God. Can you imagine an imagination? Adam got that imagination from God. So it was vast, it knows no limits, and if Satan could gain control of a man's imagination, where could he go with it? So now you have an idea of how men can live with things. That's why if you you don't you start judging people, say, I don't know how they do that. I don't know how they could do that. If you lend your mind to that long enough, you would do it too. So when I begin to wonder, how does men know they stole an election or something and they live in the office as if they did it, knowing they're living a lie? Well, this is how. If you lend your mind to it, if I lend my soul to it long enough, you could walk in it too. We could do the same thing, but for the grace of God. And the born-again human spirit hears the voice of the Almighty. But a lost spirit Here's this voice. You know, Jesus said, if your eye be full of darkness, then he said this, how great is that darkness? In other words, there's levels to it you've never seen. This is heavy stuff today, isn't it? Yeah. The acts of sin were moved into the realm of the imagination of imagination. They were imagining ways to sin. Man had now under Satan's leadership, their imaginations. They would dream up ways to steal, to kill, to destroy. Man never dreamed there were so many ways to die. Before man sinned, he didn't know how to steal, kill, or destroy. Adam never thought about stealing until he sinned, but now he did. Greed and actions of fear was prompting everything. Adam told the Lord, he said, the Lord God came walking in the garden. That means he came conversating. In the cool of the day. Where are you, Adam? Where are you, Adam? Adam means blood shining out of his face. It's the covenant name, Adam, where God had breathed light into him. And his blood, God's blood, which is light, mingled with Adam's blood, which was red. And it mingled and lit up to show who had the covenant with God. Where are you, Adam? He said, I hid myself because... I was afraid. I was afraid. When he disobeyed, 
So fear was prompting everything. When he disobeyed God, he rebelled against the truth of God's word. Don't eat of this tree. Give this tree to me. And everything will produce free. The day you disobey me and eat of that tree, you're going to lodge death. You're going to cause spiritual death that day. You will die spiritually. You'll be separated from me that day. And in dying, it'll bleed over into the, everything you have. Because out of the man's heart flows the issues of life or death. And if your eyes got darkness in it, how great is that darkness? Well, it had reached its first depth now, rebellion. But it was soon to get deeper and deeper and deeper as Adam lived longer and longer in sin. And his children and his grandchildren and their children began to reproduce all of them with this sin nature that would respond to Satan's voice, using. And Satan knows he's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy and the word kill there is not he come to offer a sacrifice for redemption. It means he came to murder, to slaughter. When he disobeyed God, when Adam disobeyed God, he rebelled against the truth of God's word, and this nature was born into him. As men multiplied on the earth, stealing was happening, stealing things, stealing each other's wives, stealing dreams, Stealing anything of value. Killing began then. From Cain it started. When Cain wanted to steal Abel's relationship, his acceptance with the Lord. His grand solution to steal his acceptance was to kill his brother. But he had never seen what it would take to kill a man. But he had seen what it would take to slaughter an animal. So when it says he, Abel's blood cried to the Lord from the ground, he slaughtered him. The word means he slaughtered him. It's the word slaughter. He slaughtered his brother. He killed him like a sheep. And as his blood was oozing out of his body, he was crying out to God, hold, don't hold Cain guiltless. Cain murdered me. Cain murdered me. But also in, in, in Abel's blood, it was Abel crying out from, from as he was losing his blood. I don't know if I said Adam, I meant Abel. was calling out. And he said, Cain murdered me. Don't hold him guiltless. <clears throat> but because there was lemons in his blood, because there was light, the cross was inside his DNA, it also cried out for redemption. Redemption, <clears throat> and it showed up in Cain. Cain, yes, because where sin abounds, grace much more does abound. And when the Bible said, when Cain called out, my punishment's greater than I can bear, in Genesis 4, the Lord said he marked him, put a mark on Cain. The Hebrew says it was the letter Tav, the cross mark, the lamon the cross, the redemption. And he put it on Cain and said, whoever kills Cain. He said he put him on there so that no one would, that met him would slaughter him. And he would reap a harvest like he killed his brother. He said, this mark will save you from that harvest. And so the first thing the bloody cross saved, the bloody covenant cross saved was a murderer who had stole. And he said, though, if I can steal, remember, Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain's was not. One of the ancient teachings <clears throat> says that fire came down out of heaven and consumed Abel's sacrifice. But it never came for Cain's. And Cain wanted that acceptance. And Abel told him, he said, you could be accepted too if you do the right thing. You know what's right. And he went and it was a prophecy given to Cain by Abel. And they went out in the field talking. And then Cain rose up against his brother and slaughtered him. It means he probably decapitated him like those animals. So now the first killing murder had happened. Now it's going to get creative after this. 
It's going to start multiplying first so that men can learn how to kill more and more. But the motive was, I want Abel's relationship. So in order to steal it, I'll kill him. So Cain killed his brother. So stealing was the motivation for the first murder. Then man began to kill everything. Men, dreams, success, everything. Stealing was always the motive. They wanted something they didn't have. Destroying people then began. Destroying people's people, things, lives, dreams, hopes, families. Man did not know how to do these things before he sinned. Their imaginations were dreaming up creative ways to steal, to kill, and destroy. And there was no end to it. It was bottomless. Man got his imagination from God, and now it was in the hand of a thief and a murderer. If Satan could not take over heaven and sit in man's place, if he could take over man's imagination, he could almost do anything. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1. We'll start there. And the earth was of one language and of one speech. Lord, show us how to understand these things. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord, God in his system of harvest, came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do. Watch this close now. And now nothing will be restrained from them. You ready for this line? Which they have imagined to do. God was now having to do battle with man's imagination, driven by Satan. And see, we know the tower was probably built because of ancient writings, but I saw this in Revelation the Lord showed me a long time ago, that it was built because when he, Satan started trying to take sin to the greatest depravity, it brought a flood in on the earth, and they were afraid of another flood. When they started doing these hybrid races of giants is what happened. Then the flood came. The atmosphere, the fabric of creation couldn't stand these hybrids. It couldn't stand fallen angels coming into a, from another atmosphere. It couldn't stand that man's imagination had gone to such depths to mingle seed and do experimentation on animals and people and all kinds of things, Satan trying to create a hybrid race to bring the seed of the serpent into this earth so that he could have a back, eyebrows, and skin. Isaiah chapter 14. And so they knew it would bring a flood. It had done it before Adam was created, and it did it after Adam was created. The same sin was perpetrated, trying to mingle seed and when it did, they said, when we start this again in Nimrod's day, they said, let's, let, let us build us a tower up so if a flood comes, it can never reach us. They had marks on the mountains to how high it had went. So their plans was to build it unto the heavens to get it above. And they were smart enough to do it because the imagination provokes innovation. The imagination will lead to innovation. Vision will bring about innovation. And innovation demands creativity to come on the scene. And men will begin to invent things. It's just like if they can't lift a 2,000-pound rock, if they have no other way, they'll invent in their imagination some leverage to pick it up off the ground. And in those days, technology was a lot smarter. People were smarter than our computers now. They could lift 30,000 pound stones with sound. Match the frequency in a stone and raise it up off the ground. 
So they were very smart, and imagination provokes innovation that demands creativity and invention. So imagination provokes innovation that demands inventions. And so they were going to build this tower, and the Lord said they could do it because they had it in their imagination. They would have figured out how the atmosphere, how they would have breathed when they got that high. They would have figured it out, just the engineering feat of a tower that high. One of the ancient writings said if a man, a man, a brick was more valuable than a man in those days. Because if a brick fell off the top of the tower, it took a year to get it back up there. If a man fell off the top of the tower, it wasn't as valuable as a brick to them. You think about that. This was the imagination and the innovation and the inventions they were moving in at the time. It, it called and it provoked the Lord from heaven to come into the earth to see what they were doing. And when he came in and saw it, it's almost like in Abraham's day. Didn't, you mean he didn't know it? Of course he knew it. That's why he came. But they were about to destroy it all. And so they didn't realize they were sowing seed for everything. So it says the capital L-O-R-D. It provoked the system of harvest to give them their harvest. See, this is why evil can't prevail forever because it can get imaginative, it can get innovative, it can get inventive. But when it does... Everything they do is sowing a seed to reap the same evil back. And when it reached up to heaven, then they reaped a, a, a harvest for their sin called Babel. Because it was revealed right up here, it said man was of one language. So they knew nothing's impossible to us. We are, we are, uh, why didn't they just say, you could say the they are arrogant, prideful. They think they're God. They're woke. They're, they're like Genesis 3, 6. Oh, and Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 6. When he says, come and look. He said, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened. You'll become woke and you'll be as God. You'll be the one to decide what's good and what's evil. And that's where they were. And so when I say it provoked God, it provoked the system of harvest. And it pronounced their harvest, babble. And it was a bad situation. It was man's imagination Satan wanted. It was the creative part of the man that could think up anything. Stealing, killing, and destroying became an art to wicked men. Men imagined ways to steal, to kill, to destroy. Man's perversion began to dive deeper and deeper and deeper. Satan moved in his thoughts to begin to cross genetics and experiment on people. This ought to start sounding familiar to you after a while. The enemy began to crossbreed seed in the earth, seed from living organisms, trying to create a hybrid race of people all using man's imagination. Human sacrifice was involved. The slaughter of children to idols was involved. Innocent blood being shed on a daily basis was involved. Satan had gotten man totally dependent on him for everything. When the hybrid races were being made, in study, you'll find out that it was officials and leaders of men that were involved. Rituals, religious and sexual, mingling of seed to create a hybrid race of being in the earth in order to bring the seed of the serpent into the earth. People say, well, I'm sure I'm glad we're not in that time now. Sin has climbed to such a creative heights that nothing is sacred to powers that be anymore. Humans started slaughtering children out in the open in six states in 1971 in abortion clinics. But after 73, the doors were just kicked open and the slaughter proliferated. Planned Parenthood became the brokers of blood. 
the blood of the innocent. Washington, D.C. became brokers of blood, the selling of the innocent, the selling of innocent blood. Men burning in their own lust one for another. The scripture talks about it leaving the natural use of the woman. And even the woman began burning in their lust one for each other, leaving the natural use of the man. Satan using the imagination of men to create elaborate plans to get his agenda in the earth. Women's rights movements. The gay and lesbian movements. It's moving something to another place. Satan got his hooks in the government first in order to broaden his agenda. The first thing was he knew that man did not live by bread alone. But he knew that man lived by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He learned that from Jesus on that mountain. Therefore, he had to do something about the Bible in order to make this happen. If the Bible was being read in public schools, man would never go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree was to make men think they were gods. They created good and evil. Gods that created good and evil. Then it's only good if they say and bad only if they say. So he removed the Bible and prayer and put great restrictions upon them. With the source of life out of the way, groups like LGBTQ and whatever other letter of the alphabet they stick on it, they imagine to put with it is added. Stealing, killing, and destroying is most prevalent today. There's hardly any restrictions on it, and that's just in government. The greatest pool of wealth there is is in the populace. The people, not just their money, but their dreams, their ideas, their lives, themselves. The reason to control the populace is to harness their imagination. Just like the Tower of Babel. Noah Harari, when they ask him, they call him the prophet. He is the he is a false prophet. You want to see what a false prophet looks like? Look at Yuval Noah Harari, prophet of the, of the WEF and the, the World Economic Forum and the powers that be and the higher echelon where they're controlled by wicked spirits in the heavenlies, wicked spirits in high places. There's four ranks of spirits you deal with. Principalities is the lowest. Powers is the next up. That's where the political realm operates. Uh, rulers of the darkness of this world is the illusion that the, that the dark world creates for men to look at. And then the highest is spiritual wickedness in high places, and that's where he is. That's why the WEF had a witch come on there platform and a lot of people saw that online and blew on them well that's a counterfeit for the passing of spirit Jesus breathed on his men when he rose from the dead that's breathing consciousness into someone Jesus wanted his men when he rose from the dead he said he breathed on them and said receive ye the Holy Ghost that's when they got saved he wanted to breathe in their consciousness, the conscious knowledge that he possessed, the conquering Christ, the conquering Messiah that had defeated death, hell, and the grave and had redeemed man from all destruction. And as soon as he couldn't wait, man, he was looking forward to the, to the time when he came back out of hell, dragging death by the juggler and threw it down on the ground. And then when he, he took his blood into heaven and, and sprinkled it on the heavenly mercy seat and sat down on that seat that was the first Adams, the last Adam now is seated there making intercession for us. He came up to his men after his resurrection and breathed on them. <sighs> What's he doing? I want the consciousness in me to be in you now. That you are victorious, the conquering body of Christ. Hallelujah. So he breathed on them the, there. And so on the WEF platform, they had a witch come on. She came on doing all her witchy, wee -hoo -ha -hoo -ha, dancing around, just dancing around like some kind of fool, breathing on everybody. 
Where did she get that from? She's passing consciousness to these people. And I'm sure that made hell madder than a wet hen. Breathe consciousness on those people with her wee hee 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 hoo hoo hoo. A boo boo boo. Breathing the consciousness of the damned on these leaders. Now you think about that. And we see, sometimes you'll see in meetings, man, where the Holy Ghost will have somebody blow on somebody. He's blowing his consciousness on them. It's pretty awesome. So Satan, and, and you know, and when he wants to harness their imaginations, and when this Noah Harari guy, they call their prophet, this is what he said. He said, people, we don't need humans, so many humans anymore. He actually said that. We don't need so many humans anymore. He said, well, we need them for data. What? We need them for data. We want their imaginations. We need them from, for data. And they're trying to, they'll try to figure out if Satan can unload a man's imagination into a computer, he'd do it. And that's what that man's about always, cyborgs, creating cyborgs. And this is not some guy in a back room. This is a guy when, that even Obama said, I read his book, Sapien. He likes it. Satan still has one goal in his mind, to bring the seed of the serpent into the earth, the beast, the antichrist, the man of sin whom he embodies. Notice if a man invents something that blesses and helps, governments will take it. They always take it from them. You know, I remember hearing how men could invented things that would make cars get un, unknown gas mileage. Immediately it was condemned and taken. We find a good water source somewhere coming out of a mountain. The next thing you know, we used to have this water around here that ran out of the side of a mountain. We'd go fill, fill jugs and jugs of this free stone, best tasting water you've ever drank. All my life growing up, is, I mean, since I was a kid anyway, people would stop on the highways from other states, I guess. You'd always see somebody out there filling up jugs. Because it was absolutely just pristine water. Next thing you know, we come up there. It's stopped and has a sign up says it's condemned. They say it's contaminated. Well, we drank it our whole life. It wasn't contaminated. But any time, a friend of mine had a stand of corn in another state. And a government man came out to him and said, let that corn rot. We'll pay you to let it rot. He said, that's a good stand of corn. He said, no. And if you don't let it rot, see, they're going to condemn it. So Satan wants control over food, whatever, just to harness man's imagination is what he wants. Make them use it for me, Satan demands. Depraved human, depraved human affections. Twist them. Make human life of no consequence. Push the women's rights movement until we can get them to kill their own offspring in the name of women's rights. We'll get them to experiment with the creation of humans, their imagination, figured out how to edit DNA like a computer would a Word document. They have figured out how to edit DNA. Just like a computer in a Word document, that came out of somebody's imagination, which demanded innovation, which demanded invention. Satan says, let's push the woke agenda until they are as gods and can identify with anything. Animals? Soon they'll be marrying animals. Then we'll have them into bestiality, mingling their seed with humans experimenting until it's science again the way it was in the days of Noah. Inanimate objects, get them to mingle with machines a little more and a little more. Chips, implants. It's interesting that Noah Harari is a homosexual, isn't it? 
Harari also said that 2020 was the year men agreed to be surveyed under the skin. What could he possibly be talking about? Now you know what that was all about. Now you know what that was all about. Deep fake, AIs, Hollywood, the film industry have taken stealing, killing, and destroying to a whole new level. Governments can now use technology in films and the like to present a whole illusion to the populace. Virtual reality from the metaverse is being sold to the people, listen, in real time. What do I mean by that? In real time. You're looking at everything in the political, everything going on around the world, wars, all kinds of things, is virtual illusion being shown for one thing when it's another. It's in real time. And they're trying to trap people into a world of illusion, gaslighting to the ultimate end. Harari said one day things will change. He said it'll be just like someone pulled down a movie screen and everything changes. Klaus Schwab said all these things we see are not crisis, that we see happenings, in, uh, that, that uh, COVID and all that, that wasn't crisis, he said. He said we are in transformation mode. He said some will make it through the change. He talks about how people will come through the change of it. He also said, all these things we see, you know, are not crisis. Now we know the change Obama was so adamant about. One of his favorite books was Sapient by none other than Yuval Noah Harari. So we're looking at a world where men are living in illusion now. It's an illusion. And the only real morality or anything else is living in the word you have to live in the word of god it was when adam disobeyed the word of god and got outside the word of god that all this started so it's in the word we have to have a revival like uh, uh terry tripp said that day we have to have a revival in the of the bible we have to get back in the word and have a revival of this book this has to be revival because once you get out of God's word, you're in rebellion. And that's how all of this came to be. That's how everything Adam knew that failed. All sin in Adam's life came violating when he stepped out of the word. When you step out of the word, you don't lose that, that creativity God gave you, that imagination even lost people have an imagination that's just almost unreal. And that's what Satan seeks to harness because he still wants to bring his man of sin in and he plans on doing it. So that's why Satan suddenly, demons are, are they'll scream out of people when the word is on the scene. They'll, when Jesus came into church, devils cried out said, we know you. And they also recognize authority of the word. They re Don't send us out of the, if you cast us out, if you cast us out, didn't say he could or couldn't, he, they knew he could. If you cast us out, don't send us out of the country. We fought hard to live in this land. Send us into the pigs. Well, the pigs is where they had authority to go into. So he told them, go. They went into the pigs, but the pigs said, uh-uh. The most unclean animal we know of, uh-uh, ran off of a cliff and drowned themselves in, in the Sea of Galilee. He said, uh-uh, you ain't, you ain't living in us. But humans will just lay down and let you pour slop all in their mouth. You know what slop is? I was raised slopping hogs. He was, ah, Brother Robin, I thought you were sophisticated. I am when I need to be. But let me tell you about slopping a hog. 
slop. We used to keep a, well, my uncle, it was, he's the one that manned the hogs. We lived right down the road, but we had to tend to them just like they did. And when it come time to kill them, we had to do that too, just like they did in the backyard. And so he would keep a five-gallon bucket by the door and had a board and a piece of a cinder block that it set on it. The reason being is because if you took that board off, you couldn't stand the smell. Because every meal, what was left over from every meal was raked in that bucket. What was left over from every drink was poured in that bucket. What was left over from everything in the house, all that stuff was raked off in that bucket until it just sloshed like that with just, we called it slop. And they'd put that board and that block on it. And then go down there and we'd have to go down there and feed them hogs. And my cousin, my cousin Tim wore these tall rubber boots. He had scents. Because <laughs> you'd go down there carrying that bucket. You might have two of them, I don't know. But you'd be carrying that bucket. And I remember old Sally, the hog we had down there. I remember her. She weighed close to 600 pounds, I think. Oh, she is a hog. I think she ate her babies one time. Now, this is hogs. Hogs. And she's got, he's going down through there, you know, and that's, that stuff will slosh out and get in your shoes. Well, you wear these big old rubber boots, and they'll hit the rubber boots, so that's smart. Then you go down in them hogs and run up to that fence and they'd rear up on it, stick their head out, and you just pour that in their trough and they just get it all over them. They're as happy as a pig in a pen. That's what that's talking about. Happy as a pig in slop. Well, that's what Satan feeds people. He feeds them all the refuse that humans are supposed to throw away. And those demons went into those kind of hogs and those hogs said, we'd rather be dead than have you in us. And they ran down off of that cliff and died. You say, well, them demons was driving them. Them demons was trying to fit in them. And they couldn't. A pig is not big enough for a, you don't have a spirit like a man. So today, stay in the word. All failure comes when you get out of the word. Death came. Stealing, killing, and destroying is outside the pages of this book. If the only way to bring morality back into the U.S. or any other country is God's word. We have to listen to what the Lord said and do it. This is why he said in what 2 Chronicles seven fourteen said, If uh, uh, my people which are called by my name will humble themselves, if they'll turn from their wicked ways and humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he said, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and hear, heal their land. Wicked men are always going to be trying to build the Tower of Babel. They're always going to be trying to do what Nimrod did. Bible said Nimrod became a mighty man. He was a mighty man. It actually means he began to be a, a gibberim. He began to transform himself into a giant, a hybrid race. Men are always going to do that. What did Hitler do? He tried to create a super race. It's always that way. Men always that way. What does Harari talk about? chipping a person, making them part cyborg. He said some will be just be straight-up AIs. And uh, when you, you watch, it knows no depths. They try to figure out how to upload a consciousness to a computer, to offload it. They want that imagination. Satan wants to harness it so he can have you like a mule, harnessed up, pulling his wagon through the earth. Hallelujah. But it only happens, the only escape of that is the purity and the sanctity of the word of the living God. Hallelujah. Well, that's all the teaching today. I, I don't have Krista with me today to just say, well, Krista, come and, and, and tell us <laughs> how to prosper. So I'm going to receive the offering today.
myself. But first, let me pray for you over this, this knowledge. Lord, I pray that the knowledge today that was brought forth from your word will sink deep in the hearts of the people listening and that it will grow up in them like a seed. And Lord, grow up and be greater than any problem that they face. And I give, I give you praise, Lord, honor and glory for it. And I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And heaven, earth, and everything under the earth hear this proclamation. Jesus has been given a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's the only Messiah. Mohammed's not the Messiah. Buddha's not the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And he's the only one. Hallelujah. Well, you know, before I do that, let me go ahead and, and lead you in a prayer. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, why don't you come out of that world? Some of you listening today needs to come out of that world underneath uh, uh, Shiva, the Hindu god of destruction. This is a demonic spirit. This is not, a, this is not God. Ask him who Jesus is and watch what that demon does. Jesus is your Savior. He's the King. He's the Lord. He's God in the flesh who came from heaven to redeem man from their sin and save you from a devil's hell. So why don't you just say this right now? Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and personal Savior. Forgive me of all my sin. Take my life and do something with it. I believe you died for me. And I believe you rose from the dead for me. And from this day forward, I confess you are my Lord. And if you'll do that, and then if you're coming out of the world of these false gods, you're coming out of the world of the, the false gods of, of Hinduism, Islam, and all these places, just come into this and say, I renounce these gods. I renounce these gods of destruction. I renounce these gods of Islam and Hinduism. I renounce these gods. I, re I embrace one God. Jesus the Christ. I believe there's one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, and I receive him. Go ahead, if you're in Satanism, say, I renounce Satanism. I renounce witchcraft and receive Jesus as Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And if you've done that, uh, give us an address or, or, and we'll send you a booklet, Jesus, Why It Is the Way It Is. It's a little booklet that I wrote just to show that Jesus, why it has to be Jesus and nobody else. Amen. Praise God. Now, you can go on my website, robindbullock.com, and you'll find that booklet, Jesus, Why It Is the Way It Is, and it's a free download if you want it on your phone or you want it so you can share it digitally. I wish you would. Amen. Well, that's, uh, let's move in now to our offering segment of the 11th hour. Uh, we don't, we don't, um, Come on and say, we, we, we need offerings. We beg for offerings because we don't. If you don't want to give, you absolutely do not have to. Don't feel compelled to. But there is a principle in the Scripture. And it seems like Satan chokes out people with finances. There's no other worry like money worry. It, it drives a wedge in families, husbands, and wives when it just becomes pressure because there's not enough to eat, there's not enough to pay bills, there's not enough to do these things. When God made a way for us to prosper in his word, and it's from the very beginning, he told Adam, he said, you see those trees? All these will produce free for you as long as you give me that tree. That tree is your tithe tree. Give me that as your tithe, and all these will produce free. This was seed, plant, harvest. This was offerings, tithe. It was give that to me. 
and I'll give you all of this free. He was showing him how the government of God works. You do know that everything you ate today came out of that government. Everything you've eaten came out of a seed planted and grew up and produced that food. All your clothes came out of that, that system of God's government, seed, plant, harvest. Everything you know of came out of that. You came out of that system. You were once seeds, you got planted, you grew up, and now look at you watching this broadcast. So why would we think we prosper any other way? We have to prosper by seed, plant, harvest. So nothing can hold that down. Whether you have the money, whether you don't have the money, whether you have a job, whether you don't have a job, that's the way you can prosper. And God made it that way. And in Luke 6, 38, it says, Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, God meant that. That's the words in red. That's the king talking. He said, that's how you do it. Whatever you need, he said, if you give, it'll be given to you that way. What will be? He said, give and it shall be given to you. What? What you gave. It shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet with all, it, it what? It what you gave shall be measured to you again. So if it's finances you need, sow finances. Well, what do I sow? I don't know. Whatever the Lord tells you to give. We just create the, uh, or God creates the ground. We work to keep this ground clean so you can sow. And you're sowing into putting out words like this today. You're sowing into putting out the prophetic to reach a prophetic generation to save a nation and the world. So you give. If the Lord says give a quarter, 25 cents, then that's what you sow. Obedience is better than sacrifice. If he told you to sow a quarter and you emptied out your bank account and sowed it and you say, why didn't I get a harvest? He didn't tell you to empty your account. He said give a quarter. So obedience is better than the sacrifice. But if he tells you to do that with your bank account and empty it and give it, then that's what you do. It's better than sacrifice. But know this, whatever he leads you to do, he's setting you up for this good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over blessing from heaven. Hallelujah. And your covenant begins with the tithe. So today, if you're giving, there's information, I guess, on the screen of where you can give. If you want to give into this ministry, then we'll put that information up so you can see it. It'll be in the description, I'm sure. There may even be links there that you can follow. I don't know. But I know this. God's Word works. And He wouldn't have told you that in His Word and gave you a copy of it if He didn't mean to keep that Word. So today... As you tithe and give, let me pray over you. Now, Father, as they give their tithe today, Lord God, and they bring all their tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in your house, Lord. Lord, we prove you now, Lord, if you'll not open them the windows of heaven, pour them out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Rebuke the devourer for their sake that he not destroy the fruits of their ground, neither shall their vine cast their fruit before the time in the field. And, Lord God, that all nations will call them blessed. They shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. And, Lord God, I pray as they give, it's given unto them. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, <clears throat> shall men give unto their bosom. For with the same measure that they meet with all, I pray it be measured to them again. Now, Lord God, let this blessing rest on the tither and rest on the giver. As they tithe and as they give, Lord, I give you praise and honor and glory. Lord, that neither shall their vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. Saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations call them blessed. All nations, all ethnic groups call you blessed. Racism and what would try to hold you down cannot hold you down. 
if you're a tither. Amen. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. It's been an informative 11th hour. It's been an 11th hour that makes hell and the operatives of hell so mad they can't see straight. But it invigorates the, the child of God and makes you a, the wildest, enthusiastic faith believer anywhere. So receive the prophetic word today and get excited about it. Hallelujah. Now, before I go, I want you to, to remember to get baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues. Man, that's explosive power that happened in the upper room. It went from the authority of being born again to the explosive dunamis power of having something to release that authority in. All you have to do is say, Jesus baptized me in the Holy Ghost and fire with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives me utterance. And then just start speaking in tongues. <laughs> Can I do that, Brother Robin? Absolutely, you can. You can pray that prayer. The Holy Ghost in you will rise and come up on you, and then suddenly you'll start speaking in tongues of mysteries, the language of God. Amen. I don't want you to forget that we're going to Israel in September, and it's very important we get to show Israel that we are with them. Hallelujah. You can go to Elijah Streams. Uh, dot com, and you can see about that tour. Amen. It's going to be awesome. The 11th hour band will be there. We're going to put our feet on the land of Israel and, and prophesy from God's land. Hallelujah. And if you ever thought about going, this would be a good time to go. Well, I'm afraid, Brother Robin. Well, don't be afeard. Don't be afeard. God is with us. And God is in his own land. Don't you know he can protect his land? Hallelujah. And his people. Well, until next time, we gather together right here around God's word. I want you to remember and never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom and shalom.